renewable energy sources intervening and integrating other major sources of energy which are safe and cleaner for household consumption. So far as, as PDI, we have intervened or integrated or responded to this project as we use the, the so-called art work. We use art. As you can see behind us, we have displayed some good pictures. As you can see, a bed on the tree, this, this signifies our globe or our earth, where we dwell, where we, we live in. So far, what we do as PDI in response to this project, we try to convey messages to the local context, to the local community, to the local people, so that they change from older methods of energy, of household consumption energy, to renewable and safe and cleaner energy, like solar energy, like gas, like charcoal briquettes. So far, as for now, we have succeeded, implemented these projects and reached out to the community for more than 300 people, including women and youth. And we have integrated the local representative, the local officers, helping us to reach here and there, reaching various people, especially youth and women, who are the major users of energy. There is no life without energy, but energy does not mean to, to destroy or to pollute or to degrade our environment. We use energy, but we should remain safer, we should remain protected. So far, our earth has been our home, and our home should be protected. Protecting our home is our duty, not only me, everybody across the globe must protect the environment. So as, as PDI, we have taken this initiative to protect the world through addressing messages, through telling people, through convincing people to use cleaner energies so that we make this effort, joint effort, as the world is doing right now, to protect our environment. So far, we, we have tried to, to address some good news and education on how to, to use energy and, and how to protect our environment through using cleaner energies like solar energy for our, our home consumption. Solar energy is a form of energy that is considered as renewable because it leaves or it doesn't impact non-significant effects to the environment. So the environment will remain safer and we enjoy our energy. Coming to gas, gas is naturally, naturally harvested from the ground. So it doesn't impact any non-significant to the environment. So far, coming to charcoal briquettes, charcoal briquettes, we don't cut down the trees. So we, we, our, our environment, our forest will remain at the yard. So we encourage, we insist the community, the people, the youth, the women to go for renewable energy sources because they impact positively in our environment. The, our environment will remain safer and as human beings who are dwelling in our earth will remain safer. No effect will come after us. So thank you for listening from us. We are trying to address this message not only today. This is our sustainable work that we will do today, tomorrow and every day. Thank you across the globe. Thank you for listening from us. We love you. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we are excited to kick off today's session live from COP. Uh, my name is Akila Kolasetti and I am a team member of the Grassroots Justice Network team at Namati. And I'm very excited to be here with all of you for this important conversation today. 
Um, we hope you enjoyed that video, which was submitted by our members, uh, PDI in Tanzania. And um, I hope you were able to hear the audio. If not, we have links to the videos uh, in English and Swahili in the chat. And I think it's a great example of the, the work that our members are doing using um, different movement building tactics like murals, artwork, uh, to spread their message about sustainability and renewable energy. So we are really inspired every day by members like these who are working within their communities and creatively tackling the climate and environmental crisis. Um, so before we get started, this event is going to have a simultaneous interpretation. And um, I, let me just pull up a slide here. One second. My name is Sani Loi Aradwa from Nigeria, from Kazuna oh. State. Hello. Hello, thank you. Um, and please, you know, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, please share your name, please share where you're coming from. It'll be great to hear from everyone uh, today. So one second. Okay. I hope you can see this slide. Okay, great. Um, so we will have simultaneous interpretation today. Um, and just please uh, navigate to the bottom of your screen, click the globe icon, select the language, English, Spanish, or French that you would like to listen in. And uh, just a few reminders to help our interpreters. Um, if you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute so we can hear the speakers. If you are speaking, please introduce yourself. Um, please kindly uh, speak slowly so that our interpreters can follow what you're saying. Please spell out any acronyms that you might be using. And um, if you can stay in a quiet space so that there's not too much background noise, uh, use a headset, that would be really helpful. Um, so thank you and thanks so much to our uh, amazing interpreters today. So today we're gonna be streaming uh, live from COP for the first time. Members of our network have traveled from all over the world to Dubai and COP to help ensure that the decisions made there, uh, especially around issues like carbon markets, are informed by the needs and priorities of impacted communities. And so we're excited to hear from all of them today. Um, and my colleague, Rebecca Iwerks, uh, who leads the Land and Environmental Justice Initiative at the network, will be moderating a discussion with some of our members who are there in person today at COP. So Rebecca, over to you. Um, Oh, actually, uh, before we get started, maybe, Rebecca, uh, we, we also wanted to share a few polls. So let me share that before we get into the discussion. Um, we wanted to get a sense of all of you and how relevant COP is uh, from for your work today and for your work with communities. And I wonder, for some reason, um, my... Hmm. The polls are not working for me. I think I uh, I was wondering if Rebecca, so you're I, able to see I them? can see the COP28 poll. Do you want me to launch that? Yes, perfect. That would be great. So everyone should see three questions. How relevant is COP to your work as part of your work with communities? How familiar are you with the negotiations that are happening in that COP? And are you familiar with the issues of carbon market and how communities are impacted? And you can say very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar at all. Are others seeing the poll? Yep, they're, they're, it is being answered. Great. Perfect. We have about half of the folks who have answered the first question, but just scroll down and you can see the other questions too. We'll give people another minute as they get to all three of the questions. I know it's a big block of text to find your own language in, so thank you for your persistence. Um, it, 
it's wonderful to see from so many folks about where you're coming from as we um, speak together. All right, and we'll give you uh, about 15 more seconds before we close the poll. Um, and just don't forget to scroll down to the last question. You should be able to see um, another question. I know it's tricky on phone sometimes. All right, we will end the poll now. And let's see. Everyone should be able to see the results. So most folks are finding it pretty relevant, though about just over a third think it's somewhat relevant. And then people are somewhat familiar with the negotiations and somewhat familiar with the issue of carbon markets and how communities are impacted. Thank you, Rebecca. Um... So it's clear that I, I think many of you probably have questions about the negotiations that are happening at COP and how it's relevant to the communities that you're working with and a part of. So we thought to just provide a quick overview of COP before we dive into our session with our speaker. So we're going to stream a short explainer video that shares a little bit about the history behind COP and what's um, been accomplished over the years uh, to get us up to speed. So let me just share that. COP stands for Conference of the Parties. The gatherings are intense technical negotiations brokered by the UN. Countries are meant to work together to coordinate a global effort to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. But progress at successive COP summits has been limited. The first climate COP summit took place in Berlin in 1995, and representatives from more than 170 states or territories attended. Two years later, at COP3 in Japan, countries agreed to the Kyoto Protocol, in which 37 industrialized states or territories were legally bound to start reducing their emissions. But the biggest polluter at the time, the United States, refused to ratify the agreement because it didn't oblige developing nations like China to cut emissions. And without the United States and China on board, the Kyoto Protocol began to crumble. Then at COP21 in Paris, there was a breakthrough. The Paris Agreement was adopted by more than 190 parties, including the U.S. and China. Its ambition was to limit global warming to well below 2, but preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrialized levels. Since then, progress has been slow, and pledges by governments across the world haven't gone far enough, even as deadly extreme weather has gotten more intense and cost of inaction has skyrocketed. At COP26 in Glasgow, countries signed an agreement that for the first time acknowledged the role of fossil fuels in the climate crisis. But the conference also had its shortcomings. India successfully demanded that the final agreement would commit countries to phase down rather than phase out planet heating coal. COP27 in Egypt saw countries agreeing to set up a loss and damage fund to help vulnerable nations hit by climate disasters. But while the intent to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius was reaffirmed, progress so far has fallen far short, where scientists say it needs to be. All right, so I hope that helped us catch up to where we are today um, at COP28. Um, and today you'll hear all about the main priorities that communities have for uh, the negotiations that are happening today. Um, and so I will now turn it over to Rebecca to share a little bit more about carbon market, the context for today and moderate our discussion with our speakers. Um, and let me pull up our slides again. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Rebecca Iwerks and I work with Namati and the Grassroots Justice Net Network. Um, and it has been my um, pleasure to be here in Dubai with a number of our network members. And we thought that it might just be, um, and 
at Namati, um, as all of you know, um, we think everyone comes into a space with something to learn and something to share. So I know that um, one of the things that this particular space is known for is having lots of very different um, uh, acronyms and uh, types of knowledge. Um, so please feel free to ask questions throughout this conversation um, and to um, continue to um, help us um, think about how to talk about these things in different ways um, and in ways that are most relevant to the work that you are doing. Um, and so we wanted to, because people are coming from really different um, experiences, wanted to just quickly go over um, the idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about carbon markets. And so um, overall, um, what you see in this slide is industry on one side is putting up carbon into the air, right? So it's this this gas that is put into the air and that it harms the air, it makes our lungs um, have trouble breathing, but it also harms the atmosphere. Um, and it makes it so that uh, it is the one of the elements that makes the climate um, crisis continue. But um, trees and grasslands and soil and other things on the other uh, hand can absorb, can pull carbon into the ground, uh, can pull, can suck in carbon. Um, and so the idea of a carbon market is that um, when, um, if there is a company that is emitting um, and they, and or um, people in general are emitting and we want to increase the amount of absorption that is happening, that that has a value to it, that the absorption itself is a activity that people want to preserve and um, increase. And so as a result, there are different parties that come in different companies um, and different uh, philanthropies and different um, all sorts of different actors that we might talk a little bit about today who uh, ask communities to be able to um, change the way that they are using their land so that there's more absorption happening on that land. Um, and that is the, that's the big picture of what's happening in carbon markets. And really what is within the UN global framework um, uh, about climate, the, that is the big agreements that countries are making with each other about how to avert the climate crisis. There is a type of carbon market that is uh, called, um, that is often referred to um, as Article 6. And within that, um, there are some ways about how countries trade with each other about carbon markets. Um, and that is Article 6.2. And there are ways about how companies or other actors and even governments as well um, want to use carbon markets. And that is called Article um, 6.4. And so that is the big picture of where we are um, in these conversations. But I think as you'll hear from a number of our network members, in addition to whatever is coming out of Article 6.2, in the Article 6 conversations about carbon markets here. Um, there are a lot of experiences of carbon markets already happening in a number of places. Um, and that is an experience that can inform and perhaps influence how these carbon markets are set up under the UN framework. Um, and so I am so excited to introduce to you, and Akila, perhaps we can um, remove the slide. And I'm going to add our other um, speakers. We have Iris. Uh, there you are here. Let me move my spot. Iris, why don't you say hello and um, um, introduce yourself, Iris, um, and tell us a little bit about the communities that you work with. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Fantastic, can you hear me? Yeah, is this okay? Okay. Thank you very much. So my name is Iris Olivera, and I work in the Organization of Environmental and Natural Resources. And 
in Peru. And we work in the Peruvian Amazonia with the indigenous people that are represented in this Amazonian basin. And uh, we do this follow up of the public policies and in the carrying on of these safeguards that are related to carbon markets. So those indigenous people from the Amazonian area are located in different communities, native communities. And in South America, in Peru, this is the the second country with the biggest forest after Brazil. So we could say that uh, it's a very important country and it's very attractive for the companies that are related or linked to carbon markets. And it's been already several years where we have been identifying different cases and processes of this kind of subrogation of rights from the native communities, but also with the different representative organizations. So, Rebecca, would you like me to explain the process or do we wait let's, for our colleagues to present themselves? What do you let's have them? the other colleagues present themselves mm -hmm. first and then we can all talk together. Um, so we have Matuso who is joining us from Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association. Um, and if you could, um, Matuso, please introduce yourself and tell us about the communities that you work with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rebecca. Uh, my name is uh, introduced as Matuso Luwayo. I work with the Public Interest Environmental Organization called the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association. Uh, we work with communities that um, are rich in natural resources, including wildlife, land, and forests. But more often than not, because they don't own these resources whenever there are investors on board that are interested in those resources, they end up losing because um, they don't own it, it's state land, it's owned by the state. And all they have is basically use rights and access rights, maybe to, to farm, to cultivate, to fetch firewood, uh, and uh, to graze their cattle and goats. Yeah, but in terms of ownership, they don't. Yeah, so that's why there is this big challenge that whenever investors come and are interested, whether it is... Uh, those carbon uh, markets that they're interested in, they may end up losing out on their lands and forests. And that's where we come in as an organization to work them, to really understand. Uh, and uh, for us, that's why I'm interested in participating in this conversation to really understand how carbon uh, markets work and ensure that we prepare the communities in terms of raising awareness, building their capacities so that they're also able to engage and negotiate um, if there are benefits so that they're also able to, to get benefits and we advocate for issues like access to information, participation, and free and prior informed consent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matusa. And um, we have Purity joining us as well from um, Kenya. Um, Purity, why don't you say hello and tell us about the communities that you work with? Um, hello. Allow me to probably make an apology. My video is not working. So for now, allow me to just use my audio version. My name is Piri Tigakuo. I work for Impact. Impact is an organization based in Kenya. And we work predominantly with pastoralist communities um, in Kenya. These are communities who are predominantly uh, known for living in the rangelands. And as Motusa said, uh, pastoralist communities are indigenous communities in Kenya who also uh, incidentally live in areas that are rich in resources and who have for years been grappling with uh, the challenge that is mainly for indigenous communities on ownership of land and securing their tenure rights. Yes, and for me, this is an important conversation because this is also the same land that not only has seen interest in other types of investments, mega investments, but also has gained a lot of interest when it comes to carbon markets and carbon credits. So in addition to other investments coming, 
an intersection of newer projects and particularly this carbon market also have found themselves in the same area where communities are still grappling with an intersecting number of issues and challenges. Yes, so yeah, I'll be happy to contribute and also learn from the rest of the teams here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um... Iris, why don't we start with you? And I think the next question for all of you is really this, this idea of what, um, why this year at COP? Um, what is going on that seems um, uh, most relevant um, at this particular COP to, to your communities? And, and what message are you most trying to emphasize this year? Thank you, Rebecca. Well, for our institution, it's important this moment because we are in this COP28 and uh, this is important because they are closing some negotiations uh, for 2025 that are related to different issues uh, linked to, to reducing these commitments of the climate change. So as I was saying, I'm going to show with I'm going to share with you some images so you will see how is the forest in the Amazonian area in South America and Peru as I was saying before is the second biggest uh, forest I mean the second country in terms of the size of the Amazonian forest after Brazil therefore that is a big interest from different states and from different companies on reducing the emissions through our forests that are in in those territories so but they are not doing the real effort to produce or to reduce their own emissions in their country that means that with this interest of these companies it's not only that some companies are reaching to improve or to have uh, to propose different agreements with different communities it's not only that but the same country itself the government is developing been different projects related to these processes. And just to give you an example, we have an agreement uh, with uh, between Peru and, and Germany. Um, this agreement is already five years, bilateral agreement. So the same country have been signing bilateral agreements with Colombia also because they have also Amazonian forests. And now they are oriented to reduce emissions for deforestation and degradation of soil. So in the case of Peru, uh, Peru, the country is receiving money to have their legal structure to develop projects and processes that are called red processes. That is the emission reduction due to re deforestation and degradation. But the something that we have been talking about for many, many years, that is that even though we have those projects, even though we have these bilateral agreements, Peru have not yet uh, fulfilled the commitment of implementing and following the safeguarding related to indigenous communities. So nowadays we have many observations from the indigenous communities where those communities are saying that different companies come close to these communities and they offer this kind of contract to have this uh, carbon reduction, but they do not receive the information of what is the project about, or they do not know the, the details of the company, they do not know the information, they don't have the information about the company, and the state doesn't have a registered list of those companies or of those projects that have been developed in the Amazonian era. Um, or native communities. And it seems like uh, this is non-formal at all. Despite the fact that the Peruvian government is receiving finance related to this project. And in fact, they have a bilateral and national project and national agreement with Norway. So we are worried because we want to see if these safeguarding elements are there because we want to see if there is the respect to in terms of so I'm sorry to interrupt. It sounds like the Spanish is coming on the English channel. 
Oh, I think I think it's fixed. Go ahead. You don't need to change what you're doing. Yes, it's okay. It, can we switch now? Do we need to change something for the interpretation? Akila, or are we should we try um, again? Let's try again. But yes, I'm not hearing uh, Iris in the channel for some reason. Let me let me see if I can figure it out. Yes. Eh, pero si para los demás se escucha, se escucha bien, no hay problema. No, Iris, no se escucha bien. Estamos escuchando desde el canal de interpretación en español la interpretación en inglés. Exacto, es, eso me pasa a mí. Okay, now can you hear it in the English channel? Yes, I can. Hello, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, that's better. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Which is fast. So why are we so interested in COP, in COP28? It is because in 2023 until 2024, we are finishing the different processes of negotiation that have to do with Article 6, especially 6.2 and 6.4, that are related to carbon markets and carbon credits. And we are interested in showing the need that the urgency that for the government in Peru to comply the implementations of these safeguards, especially for indigenous community in what has to do with transparency, with participation, but also with the supervision in the territories. We need all these actions to be supervised in the territories, all the everything that all the companies doing in these uh, territories. This is not happening at the moment. The government is not supervising what's going on uh, in the territories. They don't even know which, which companies are going into the territories. And they, they're not, they're not giving us the information either. And there is neither a system of information that is accessible for local communities. This is not a, we're not asking for a web page. The, we only have a website with the very, very basic information, but all the information system that would be required under this uh, transparency framework and in the Paris Agreement says that it has to be a system that the community understands that is accessible for all the communities so that they can have all the necessary information about this type of processes and negotiation. And this is not taking, it's not happening at the moment. Also, we need a mechanism to a claim a mechanism Precisely some days before coming here, the government of Peru published a new a mechanism to be able to, do, to denounce and uh, publish any claim that are 
tied to the red project but this is very basic and has come very late we don't have any supervision mechanism they're not including any type of supervision mechanism that means going to the territory monitoring what's going on monitoring what type of companies are there and seeing if the information mechanisms are being complied and what are the risks if we have no safeguards or the safeguards are not implemented and we don't have these mechanisms the contracts of the carbon credits at this moment are not supervised so so the communities are giving their legal representation to the company to the intermediary they don't know if it's a formal company if it's a real company if they are actually registering uh, the carbon credits uh, or it's all like a kind of a carbon cowboy that's what they call them like a pirate of the carbon that they are only interested in getting the representation the of the community and then do their business at an international level they also sanction the communities and they ask them for contracts with confidentiality clauses in a way that they are limited they, they can't even share the information they have limitations uh, to share the information and also their business structure of these projects is very similar to the to the forest contracts the extraction of forests they used to do the same thing with forests also there's another impact that we want to highlight is the social impact that is to say that communities when they receive these companies they think that it's something like uh, there's something important that they're going to receive a lot of money and their organizations they don't worry i'm going to do my business i don't want to distribute the money that i'm going to receive but they don't know the conditions and this is creating great fragmentation and divisions in the communities and in or in indigenous organizations it's having a terrible terrible social impact which is maybe not so visible but it's causing a lot of divisions between different communities and organizations i want to stop here because i'm so following what's going on in cop thank you thank you so much and um I think uh, for those of you who aren't here, you should know that um, Iris and her colleague Maya have been going and doing as many panels and discussions as they possibly physically can um, to be able to really share this, um, this story, these stories with as many people as can listen to, to them. Um, Mutuso, I know from hearing you and your colleagues speak about this this week that um, Zimbabwe is also a place where there are lots of challenges right now with carbon markets um, and where your government has recently done some, um, has some new regulations to try to respond to those markets. I would love to hear more about what you and your team, tell us more about what you and your team are um, the messages that you're bringing at COP and how you have been engaging in the space here. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. So uh, we are very much interested in COP because of the issues that are being discussed here, primarily the focus on, on loss and damage and also the issue of um, carbon credits. Zimbabwe is one of those countries that is um, affected greatly by climate change and its impacts on human rights, whether it is the right to life, food, the right to health, the right to development itself. So we are very much interested in terms of understanding the mechanisms that are going to be used to operationalize loss and damage. But secondly, our interest also focuses on these uh, carbon markets, which is basically the reason why we're having this meeting. So for us, 
the government of Zimbabwe Okay. The government of Zimbabwe has already actually signed some agreement and ironically with the United Arab Emirates uh, for these uh, carbon credits. But for us, the first thing is we don't really know what these um, agreements are all about, what is contained there in terms of uh, the agreement between the government of Zimbabwe and the government of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's all shrouded in secrets. We are simply told that there are going to be benefits to the country, there are going to be benefits to the communities, but we don't know the provisions to say what is there, what is provided, and uh, whether there are going to be benefits or not. And for us, the concern is that this is not the first time that we have had the government of Zimbabwe or our government touting what they call mega, mega deals that they've signed with investors, but without us really seeing those benefits translating into benefits for communities that are directly affected and for the general citizen at large. So the, the, the reason why we are basically here is to understand more uh, from engaging these conversations, from meeting experts, from interacting with colleagues. I think uh, we've had colleagues from uh, South America. I think they are, these carbon markets issues are fully developed. So we are here to interact with them and learn from their experiences to say, look, how are these uh, carbon markets operating in Southern America? What are the benefits, if any, and what are the challenges that are associated? And from us, once we have learned this learning and sharing, it will help us because, as we said, we plan to do a lot of advocacy in terms of these carbon markets. So the starting point is that they are there. Our government has already signed. So whether we like them or not, we have to prepare the community to really understand, to say there is this thing that is called the carbon markets and our government has already signed and it's coming. So for us, from this, we hope to build the capacities of community to really understand what these carbon markets are all about, the negative impacts and benefits, if there are any. But uh, from what I'm seeing, hearing, we are not hearing any benefits. So for us, we would want to use this networking, this information to go and build the capacities of our communities to really understand what these are. And also, if we are able to get those contracts, actually share with these communities, break them down and say, this is what is provided for in terms of uh, the agreement between the government of Zimbabwe and the United Arab Emirates. Then out of that, make them understand their rights based on existing legislation and policies at the national level. We have the constitution, we have the Environmental Management Act, uh, we uh, have other policies as well. And there's also a statutory instrument that is actually being assigned, or statutory instrument that is being signed, and also a carbon credits framework. So understand what is there, what, what do they say about community benefits, about community rights, and use those to empower the communities as they prepare to engage in these carbon markets, whether it is to fight against them or to other. But at least we feel that the least that we can do is basically to provide information and build their uh, capacities. And one of the justification that is often given uh, by business and companies and is, is this marginalization of community. <laughs> so we want to help them, to help them, equip them so that they're also able to engage effectively, whether it is with the government or the private sector in terms of uh, their interests. How can this be protected? Whether it is the environmental safeguards, whether it is the social safeguards, whether it is this idea of pre fryer and informed, informed consent. Because the provisions are there if you look at national legislation, international legislation, and also regional legislation. So for us, we feel that with uh, this information, we are going to help communities in terms of raising awareness, building their capacities, so that they're able to engage with that is the policy makers that they're dealing with, whether it's government agencies and departments that are responsible, then, and if there are any benefits, I mean, because we, that's what we hear, that there are also benefits that can be associated. But as I said, from these conversations, 
uh, it appears as if these benefits are a mirage. So if there are those benefits, how can we prepare these communities to also get these uh, benefits? Because our constitution says communities have the right to derive economic benefits from the resources that are exploited from their localities. So in this case, the targets are forests. And we know that forests are a source of livelihoods. Communities graze their lands there, beekeeping, uh, all those other things, cattle, and do all these other things. So if there are benefits that are going to be reaped from there, what share can the communities get? So I think for us, it's basically equipping them. Because as I said, not engaging in carbon markets or carbon credits conversation is not an option because they're coming. Uh, irregardless of whether we like them or not, the government has already signed. So how do we ensure that we prepare the communities uh, for those uh, engagements to make sure that their rights are respected, protected, and where they are violated, uh, what mechanisms are there for holding those that are responsible accountable? We are lawyers. So one of the strategies that we use is to litigate. So through this knowledge that we are getting, we are also preparing for possible litigation as a way of providing access to remedy to communities if their rights are violated, if their rights are not respected, and if their rights are not protected uh, through these uh, carbon markets. So those are our objectives as an organization to learn and share experiences, understand, and then use that information when we get home to work with these communities that we represent so that the, their rights are respected, protected, and promoted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matuso. Um, and uh, I think you gave us a really strong view of both what your government is trying to do and how that is falling apart on the ground um, and, and where the gaps are in trying to do that. Um, Purity, you live on a community that has found itself in the middle of a carbon market um, and have been in the process of renegotiating some of that. Tell us a little bit more about what brings you to COMP, what, you, what have been your key messages here and um, what you have been uh, seeing and learning while you're here. Um, I would say that <clears throat> as someone who's attending COP for the first time, this is a learning experience for me and has been for many of my colleagues. And, our, and it's quite interesting to see the international or the global spaces that um, actors step in and decisions are made here that sometimes come back to impact communities on the ground. So working with a grassroots organization that is directly working with communities, I'm realizing just how important it is for, for them to actively participate in some of these engagements, to be present in some of these meetings, to see for themselves, to negotiate. I can see a lot of negotiations on texts, uh, basically to things that that will define national legislations that come back to impact and define um, the laws that directly affect them and move them. So for me, it's been quite a learning experience. Um, already, like Putuso, Kenya has been signing deals left, right, and center. And, and I know for certain that, sure, carbon markets and the carbon credits can be as beneficial as it is. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It would be the same conversation as the renewable energy. These are good things and probably would bring money to countries like ours, but how exactly do we implement them? So for me, it's been learning and it's also just reaffirming the, the idea that communities do need to be empowered more to engage in dialogues themselves, to be present in these meetings, to be present in these conversations, so that when decisions are made on how exactly to implement carbon markets in their countries. They are here present, they're negotiating for themselves, not, not with sending representatives or not being absent in rooms that they need to be. So for me, that has been my key um, takeaway from COP. I, I can tell that uh, we, we need more, more people engaging in this, in this, certainly, yeah. Thank you so much, Purity. Um, and I want to just pause and see if there are questions from um, others who may not be here um, that you want to uh, ask. Um, I can keep 
um, asking more questions of these three all, all day long um, because I think that they have such um, great experiences, but would love to see. You can either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and uh, anything uh, from uh, what um, Purity mentioned that the just walking into this space um, is a bit overwhelming <laughs> and it very much is both physically and um, emotionally. So even just what it is like to be here questions or more about their work, um, please feel free to answer any questions um, or to ask any questions in the chat or to raise your hand. So I'm not seeing any questions yet. Do feel free to put them in or to raise your hand. But in the meantime, why don't I um, ask a question kind of along those lines, just to, to I'm curious, um, Iris, what surprised you the most about being at COP? Are you able to come off here, Eric? Okay. Oh, you see the question? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Dulin, did you want to ask a question as well? And then we can get back to that other okay. one. Go Hello. ahead, Dulin. Hello? Uh, um, Morgan, I'm sorry, Dulin had raised okay, his hand, so Morgan. let's let Dulin go first. Go ahead, Morgan. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, uh, there's a bit of background uh, noise. Um, I'm right at, I'm at the COP, so yeah, a bit of noise. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. Um, okay, uh, Dulin, go ahead. You You had a question, sorry. Bien sûr, j'ai une question. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Yes, I have yes, a question. Can you. can you hear me? Yes, I have this question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you so much for giving me the occasion to ask something. Okay. My name is Dulin Lulinda. I'm coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm so happy to see your faces, to see people here that are defending the human rights. It's something fantastic because we really need to make all our voices heard as regards the communities. I'm very interested by what said our colleague from Zimbabwe. He talked about agreements signed between his countries and the Emirates. So this is very important. And it's true that we don't know the contents and this is scandalous, I think. We also have defenders of human rights on the spot. So I would like to know, so what are you defending exactly? I'm not talking about all, only the agreements as regards the governments, but there are also many things to do within the civil society. So I would like colleagues that could interact and do things even outside the agreement side because the COP needs to recognize the local efforts that are being done too. Thank you. This is all what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks, Dulin. I'm not sure that I fully understood your, your question. Did you, is there a question that you wanted them to answer to? Yep. En fait, j ai, j ai, y avait une 
No, it was just an observation as regard what say the colleague from Zimbabwe and uh, from his speech, I would like to know whether colleagues that are defending human rights, I would like to know whether they are defending within the COP to do their best that the COP can recognize the efforts that are being deployed by the organization or is it something else like ju just like only agreements signed by the governments? I would like to know then whether there are people defending human rights on the spot and if there are also works from the social society that are buying down outside COP and that the COP needs to recognize the regional, national organizations that are assisting people from the roots. So I would like to know whether this kind of uh, um, advocacy is being done on the spot. This is my question. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the um, additional um, effort in that. I see two other questions or three other questions in the chat. I'm going to uh, read some of them out just for interpretation and then we'll do another round. Um, and feel free um, to the panelists to take which the, some of the questions and we can um, kind of divide them up as, as we go. So um, the Amanda was asking, um, have you seen a, gr a strong grassroots presence at COP? Um, and if not, how have you been able to cut through the noise? Um, David has some very specific questions um, about whether uh, in the law it makes a difference to be between owner and um, owner of the forest and owner of the carbon. And I think that, that that's a different question actually in different countries. So we can try to answer that a little bit. Um, and then at COP, whether there's any been any conversations about non-market approaches. Um, Stacy is wondering if you see um, anything being agreed around human rights and um, ethics. I'm sorry, Stacey, I'm summarizing your question a bit. Um, Kelly is wondering about observations um, about grassroots organizing at COP and how connected or not you find your messaging and demands and who's really leading those coordination efforts um, and what's needed to grow solidarity in those spaces. Um, and so that's, I think, a similar question to whether to Amanda's in some ways. Um, and then wondering um, if there's an effort or a possibility for grassroots organizations to incorporate for indigenous communities and how that connection works with indigenous communities um, in that organizing. Um, and um, I think that's a, another question of uh, how indigenous communities are considered in the carbon credit decision making, right? And how, how they have access to that law. Um, so um, why don't we go in the same order? <laughs> and you do not need to answer all of the questions, but um, please, um, Iris, it would be great to hear your thoughts on some of these. And then we'll take another round of questions if there are some more at that point. Entonces comienzo, Rebecca. Okay, so do I start? Is this okay? Perfect, great. Okay, well, I will go to the last question first, if there is any kind of participation mechanism for the indigenous communities in the COP space. The answer is yes, yes, that space is there. But anyway, we are just, uh, it's not just a question of uh, representatives from the government, uh, from the government of countries, but they are also debating right now the representation of local communities and indigenous people in China, for example, because uh, China decided that they wanted to oppose this concept of uh, indigenous people. China was opposing totally to this concept because they were saying that there is no such thing as uh, native or indigenous people. So what we do is we do this representation through the caucus, through the indigenous caucus, and the incorporation process is still uh, uh, in 
it's work in progress. And you are going to listen to the indigenous leader of the organizations of the Amazonian, Amazonian Basin that works on behalf of the nine uh, countries of uh, South America. He's saying that indigenous people are at the corridors and they do not sit together in the negotiation tables with the government of representation. So even though it's true that this possibility is there, it still needs to be executed or, or put it into, into work. And in the same line, it is needed to, we need, we see all those actions from the international platform. So it's very important to have those spaces also from your institutions that are participating, that are participating in the COP. So it's very important from your side to have those requests. And uh, at a national was, level- Just to interrupt you for a second, could you, could you tell our, people, could you tell our, people what a constituency is at COP? <laughs> you mentioned the indigenous people constituency. Could you say a little bit more about that organizing overall? Sí. Sí, um, exactly. Yes, sure, sure, yes. When we talk about the participation of the indigenous representation and local communities within the space of COP, it's done through caucus. Caucus are like platforms uh, with, that should be organized uh, by the different indigenous communities uh, by continents. So South America with Central America would have one representation, North America, another one, Asia, another one, and therefore by continent. So we would have this participation by continent, but this is not effective so far. So during these last four or five years, we've been proposing the way of participating and the election of the representatives. And that's why when they participate on, on the COP, we have from the community level, each country has its own structure of indigenous communities. So those are affiliated to regional organizations by continents, and then those have to coordinate themselves with the indigenous representations from other continents to be together, to be their participation. So that's why I was saying that although we have the option of having the indigenous participation. This is not still implemented. This is just, uh, it's like a work in progress. That's why indigenous people say that they are still on the corridors in the sense that they are not within the whole of negotiation. They are just waiting outside. They are on the waiting room, just to say. And that's why we need to work with these organizations to to help them to make their proposals visible. Is this more clear right now? Is this more clear, yeah? Okay. So, well, I don't want to take too long because I want to give some space to my colleagues. So we will have, uh, we will we'll be all together talking. Is this okay? Is this okay? Absolutely. And if we need to come back to you for some more questions, we will we will do that. Matuso, there were several questions that were legal questions about um, rights um, and how that is different between land and carbon, and also some questions about um, the, the deal in Zimbabwe. Um, I wonder if you would be able to say more about that. Uh, I think I, I didn't get the, the, the others, but the one that I had clearly was the one that related to the environment or human rights defenders. Uh, I think the from the French translation, and that's the one that I want to to speak to. Yeah, so I think even uh, at this COP, the theme of environment or human rights defenders is very topical. Um, I think studies that have been done by the likes of Publish to Pay Global Witness and many others actually show how environmental defenders are losing their lives. I think they, and even the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, they've just published a book in which they are indicating how, as a result of um, the energy transition and carbon credits, there are a number of environmental defenders that are, are being harassed. And so the threats include uh, uh, those slap suits, uh, clings, uh, the use of um, 
the judiciary, uh, persecution, harassment, and all those other things. So that's why the issue is actually very topical. I've attended a number of sessions where environmental defenders is a big theme. And uh, even yesterday, I was also on another panel. And I know there are other panels that are also happening on, on, on Friday. So this is very important because as the, these projects are happening, uh, people are beginning to understand that they are losing their livelihoods. And with the work that we are doing as so set organizations, we're empowering them. So once you empower them, then they become active in terms of demanding their rights and protecting those rights. And that's when they face these reprisals, either from business or the government. Yeah. And that's why we are saying that even at this COP, there should be that commitment to protect environmental or human rights defenders because their work is important. But more often than not, whether it is the national human rights institutions, they don't seem to, to value the work that environmental human rights defenders do compared to those that are working on civil and political rights. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that call that there should be specific recognition even within COP uh, for the role and the importance of environmental human rights defenders. Uh, they should also be given spaces to share their concerns and even engage those that are negotiating so that even the text that comes out also recognize them, their, their, their role and their importance in terms of uh, fighting for the rights of these uh, communities. So I'm an environmental defender myself. And when these communities that would have empowered are facing victimization, either from the state itself or the private sector actors, we represent them in terms of making sure that their rights are protected. So for me, I think this is one of the, what I would regard as one of the most important outcomes because environmental human rights defenders are under threat. And especially as governments sign these um, uh, deals and whoever is seen opposing them, they're regarded as someone that is acting against uh, uh, investments. But we question what kind of investments are those? What kind of development is that, that marginalize uh, a section of the society? that results in people losing their livelihoods, that results in people uh, losing their lives. So we question, who defines this development that you talk about? So once you empower them, they become active and they begin to, to demand. And some of them, yeah, through other means, uh, there's the legal sides that they use, but others also use the other strategies that we may not even be in control of. But we still feel that even those are all, whether it is protests, whether it is petition, but these are all that are uh, legally recognized as means of people raising their concerns and uh, voicing their, their displeasure in terms of those other developments. So for me, it's important that we recognize them, uh, begin, uh, begin even at the national level where we need specific legislation that protect environmental human rights defenders. Yeah. And even the companies themselves, they should also make those public commitments that they're going to respect the work of uh, human rights defenders. But not only that, even when there are those commitments, I think what is also most important is the implementation. A human rights institution should be able to monitor and enforce, because it's one thing making those provisions, but we've seen some of them not being implemented and environmental defenders continue to suffer. So for me, I think is that commitment, the enforcement, the implementation, and whenever they are targeted, I think those that are responsible should be able to set clear deterrent measures so that they don't continue to be harassed. Yeah, so I agree. I think it was Dulen who was asking that to say, um, this is a, a very important conversation that is happening here, but even at the national level, as one of the environmental human rights defenders, when we build the capacities of these communities, when we provide them with information, whenever they get targeted, we are there to support them, to make sure that their rights are, are respected, that they are not silent. But we have also had those instances of intimidation, but uh, uh, we are always there standing with the communities and making sure that uh, they, 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 they continue to voice their concerns with regards to to these um, projects. So I, I hope, my hope is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, whatever text comes out, hopefully there'll be something to do with the 
environmental human rights defenders because this is an issue that is being raised continuously. So hopefully those that are negotiating are also taking that into account. But uh, we should continue pushing. Um, I think uh, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, th 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 this is not omitted or this is not forgotten. Yeah, that's my, my, my take in terms of responding to that, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Purity. Um, please feel free to, there were a number of questions, um, in particular, some about grassroots organizing and indigenous people and how those, what, what presence you see here um, and um, how you have been able to speak through um, the net, the large number of people who are here. Um, but please feel free to take a few questions. Um, yeah, just to to confirm that indeed there's a huge representation of grassroots organizations, um, and especially the indigenous peoples group is is quite there's a big number here. Um, and also I noted that there was a there was a an affirmation that this time round the indigenous peoples pavilion was better and bigger, and they've managed to hold a number of side events. So that is quite quite uh, good to acknowledge. And just to reiterate what Iris mentioned is um, the caucus, the caucus, the indigenous people's caucus, we have representatives who are present in the negotiation rooms. And just to answer, and just to answer that, are they are they including hu human rights in these negotiations? Part of the meetings held before COP included analyzing some of the pre- pre uh, engagement before what what to preempt cop would be discussing and human rights did definitely come up a lot and especially when it comes to carbon credits the idea that we need grievance mechanisms before implementing the government the compliance markets so these were conversations that were held and the the team that was going to be present in the negotiation rooms were going to take with them these sentiments and the representation so we we may not all be present in the decision making tables, but we have representatives who are there who are trying to ensure that the text continue to reaffirm human rights. Because one of the things we believe in, and I believe this is what everybody here is here for, is that carbon markets in the implementation of should encompass human rights and should recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. So we need that that to be recognized in the text as when it comes out. So there's a lot of negotiations, and you have people trying to to make sure this these negotiations in involve yeah. include yeah. Th those important Probably. sentiments um and someone who was asking about land and rights that is when it comes to ips land you cannot separate indigenous peoples and land their land their livelihoods is entirely dependent on land so i believe even the conversations on there should, should when i when i look at legislations in kenya which want to call which want to refer to communities who are impacted or who are dealing with carbon markets as beneficiaries only and not stakeholders, I find that quite problematic, which is why they need to be present in this international, you know, uh, conversations here for them to even come back and lobby at national level. But yes, uh, yeah, that that is, is being advocated for aggressively here. Yeah, I think... Any other one I can answer? I'm not sure I remember any other ones. I feel like my colleagues have answered a number. That's quite that's quite helpful, Purity. We'll go to you first next. Let's see. Um, I see a few more questions um, in the chat, but first want to see if anyone else wants to raise their hand and come off mute and uh, share anything and any other questions. Rebecca? Yes. Yes, I just want to complement a little bit some of the questions in the chat. Please go ahead. There are a number of questions about carbon markets too in the chat. So let's uh, perhaps. Yes. yes, just two data that I think is important to take into account. That those who are want to know a little bit more about safeguards of uh, carbon markets. In COP16 in Cancun, we established the safeguards that had to do with RET, and this should be complied and implemented by each country. There's seven safeguards. I'm not going to mention all of them now, but uh, we can share them afterwards. 
and these safeguards that are established in each country that execute a red project they have to implement the what they call the red architecture and they have to comply different things but there are three things that have to do with indigenous peoples the distribution of benefits Participa participation and consultation and information transparency and information this is really really important because several colleagues have mentioned that they don't have the information the information about the projects or about the mechanisms so through this uh, framework of COP and especially through the conversations about climate change in red, it is really, really important to do this follow-up of these safeguards. And this is what we are participating in these spaces. When, when participating spaces in COP, we always mention the safeguards and we always say when there's a country that is not complying them or that they need to be reinforced maybe in, in certain countries. Also, there was a question that was, for example, if in the case of Peru, there's a difference between those who own the land and those who own the carbon. And that can, that depends on the legal framework of the country. For example, if a country, the, in a country, those who own the forests is the government, for example, then there is there's may be a risk for the population that is living in this territory because they are the ones that are administrating and receiving the benefits. And this is why the safeguard is important because the legislation of a, a country must guarantee these safeguards. In Peru, we haven't we don't have any clarity on this. The indigenous people have access to their territory, but, however, the authority administrates the, the forests. The government administrates the forests, and they there's this legal term, which means that they have like a kind of a, they can use it. It's a kind of a session. Uh, so they can use the forest, but they don't own them. But the, however, these safeguards do recognize that they should have some access to the benefits. And the other con the other question about the Article 6.8 of the Paris Agreement. Up to this week, we have progressed a little bit, but we but it's not very concrete. They are waiting for next week to continue debating but for us it's really really important to continue monitoring each and every aspect that has to do with article 6 but nothing too concrete yet till this is all i wanted to say thank you so much um i am mindful of the time so i want mm. to give purity and mutusa another chance to um, share any other reflections um, about your experience here and also how this connects, uh, you think, for other network members to the work that they are doing um, uh, in their own communities. Um, Matusa, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks. I think uh, it has been uh, a good experience. I think this is my, my first COP. Um, and um, for me, uh, I think the space itself gives us the opportunity to engage in these uh, issues. Uh, of course, the times you, you find it overwhelming. Uh, when I started, I really was a little confused because I was trying to follow a lot of, of things. But I think the moment that I decided that um, I need to focus on, on what is more relevant in terms of the, the work that we are doing, uh, we have a climate change and energy governance program. 
So that's when I felt that maybe I should be able to follow those sessions that um, are related to that. And that's why I ended up settling for the one on carbon credits and also the one on environmental human rights defenders. Yeah, so from those meetings, I was able to pick the important conversations that are happening and also able to contribute to those conversations, um, participating panels and all those other things. Yeah, so for me, um, what I'm not, not sure, based, as I said, this is my first time here. I'm not sure to what extent we are able to influence the final text or, or declaration. But for me, that's where my worry is to say, we are having these conversations. Is anyone listening? Are these going to be reflected in the declaration that are going to come out in terms of these important issues that we are pushing as society organizations that are very relevant to the communities that we work with? Yeah, because um, I think one of the issues that I saw in terms of the theme is moving from talk to action. And for me, that's the major question that I have to say, how much of these issues that we are pushing, how many of these resolutions that we are making in these meetings that we are having in society communities and, and, and community-based organizations, how much of these will be able to be reflected in the final outcomes of COP28? Uh, because when you reflect the, those four major themes of COP28, and uh, the conversations are basically mirroring that. But what would be interesting to me is when we evaluate to say, have we been able to achieve those four objectives that are guiding us in terms of um, the text that is going to come out? So for me, uh, not knowing how it works, because as I said, this is my, my first one, I'll be very curious to really see what comes out. And probably that is what is going to help me to really understand to say, look, were these conversations worth it? Were we able to make uh, an impact in terms of influencing the negotiation processes? Or uh, we're just here uh, just to uh, speak to ourselves without anyone listening. So yeah, I'm hopeful, but also worried to say, look, how uh, are people hearing us out there? Or are we talking to ourselves? Are we talking to the, or preaching to the converted? Uh, we are here as, as society, society organizations that have got interest in, in, in these matters. But at times what I've not seen is the interactions between us and those uh, policy makers, those decision makers that are listening to these issues and acting on them. So that, that's my concern, Rebecca and other colleagues. Yeah, but um, as I said, I'm new to the space. Who knows, maybe they're watching, maybe they're listening and uh, maybe they'll show us <laughs> by the, the through the, the declaration of the outcome to say, look, we are listening. So that's my hope. Yeah, but in terms of um, reaching and reaching conversations, in terms of experiences that we use when we go back uh, to our countries, I think I've gained a lot and hopefully this will enable me to serve the communities that I work with better. So I live here more empowered, more knowledgeable about these issues that I'll be focusing on. And hopefully this will also be reflected in terms of uh, uh, the support that I'm going to give to the communities. And uh, I think uh, from these conversations, I've seen a number of people that are actually knowledgeable about these issues that are also be following up on in terms of uh, getting more information. I think Iris, is very much knowledgeable. I think I've also heard from Purit. So I'll, I'll be reaching out to you, uh, Rebecca, in terms of getting contact details so that I can follow up in terms of um, understanding better some of these issues and how we can also use the knowledge in terms of our programming. So uh, back to you, Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matuso. And Purity, I believe this is also your first COP, and I'm curious um, in closing what your thoughts are overall and, and how what you will be telling the community when you go back um, to Kenya. Um, uh, I think maybe just to say that I have it was interesting to to see just how much how mean how much interests really do play here at COP, just to see how 
well, I, I interacted with somebody who made a comment and said, this is probably the one place you can interact with some government officials easily as opposed to in our own countries because of appointments. But that was quite interesting. I, I want to say that what I feel I'll be taking back home is I believe communities need to to be present in this uh in this in some of these international negotiations right and to 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 realize that re the recognition is here globally and for indigenous peoples for me that was quite affirming i really liked that part to learn that this recognition of ips at this at this level their contribution in various forms that was very affirming and uh it also just informed me that the people negotiating in this in these levels these international levels need to be in touch with what is happening at the grassroots otherwise there can be instances of major disconnect in that area so when it comes to negotiating for let's say things about human rights in carbon credits are they really in touch with the different context in these different regions when it comes to discussing traditional knowledge in its context in some of this like we they need to 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 be in touch and to be more aware of what is happening on the ground. And for me, that would be the, the one thing that I, I think I have picked up the most, but also learning that carbon credits are coming bigger and bigger now, it is an affirmation. So communities need to be, like Mutiso said, the capacity of communities need to be heightened in a way that they need to participate in these engagements, not as players but as active participants because it's coming onto their land the agreements are being signed they they are coming fast and hard the laws that are going to be put in place they need to be present in dialoguing with the national government recognition at the national level because as much as the, this comes from the international level at the ultimate level the ult ultimately is what is happening in our own countries when we look at the kenyan context where do we place communities, um, their recognition, their participation? What does benefit sharing looks like in the carbon credit conversation in our own countries? So just uh, just learning that their capacities need to be really high enough to be to be actively present in negotiating at the country level, that for me is a big takeaway and to fight for the the security of their land rights because otherwise we'll be fighting an unending battle because then the resources are coming on their land so i think i think that will be that'll be something i'll be taking home myself yeah thank you so much purity um i'm going to hand it over to akila who i know has some spec next steps um we will send an email to those participants um and follow up from this because i know there are some requests for more information and documentation um and I will say Purity's observation echoes my own of there is a large number of grassroots organizations and a large number of individual indigenous people who are here, but there is a disconnect between them and the individuals who are influencing the negotiations. Um, and in the email, we'll also send a link to a recording of a conversation we had this week that was trying to link some stories of people who are Com, um, impacted by carbon markets with those who are trying to who are deeper involved in the negotiations because I think that that is an area for future cops that we continue to be interested in exploring as purity says for folks who are directly impacted by these um, challenges to be able to advocate themselves in those spaces um, and to be able to bridge more of that um, so Akila I will um, pass it on to you with the biggest gratitude to Iris and to um, Matuso and to Purity. They are all exhausted. <laughs> um, well, they have lots of energy, but it has been a long couple of days um, to have been here. Um, and so, so grateful for you to do this um, in the evening. And um, as always, gratitude to our interpreters as well um, for um, making it possible for us to communicate um, across these different languages. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you, Iris, Purity, Mutuso. Again, I really echo um, Rebecca's sentiment. Thank you for taking the time at the end of your busy day uh, to share your experience, important experiences with our network. Um, and so I just wanted to now talk a little bit about how this, you know, this conversation is just the beginning. We hope that you will continue to engage with this movement that we are building together. Um, and I'll just share my slides again. Oops.
One second. Apologies. Are you able to see the screen? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, we know that whether you are at COP or not, we want you to be able to share your views, your experiences and the experiences of your communities with decision makers at COP. So we'd encourage you to use this hashtag. We've, we've been using this hashtag uh, across our network, the voices we need um, to really highlight the voices of impacted communities and our network members, grassroots organizations working directly with communities um, in these important discussions. So please, if you have messages, if you have stories, if you have experiences that you want people at COP to hear, uh, please share on Twitter or Facebook or social media platforms and use this hashtag and, and we'll help amplify your voices as well. And we uh, at the network um, also have several working groups around environmental justice and land um, that you can join to have deeper conversations with fellow network members to learn and to identify ways to take action together. And these are focused on corporate accountability, climate finance, and community engagement. Um, they meet about once a month online and they're Spanish and French interpretation. So if you're interested in those deeper conversations, uh, there'll be a link in the chat that will tell you how to sign up. And we also share a monthly newsletter that shares stories from our network members and their experiences um, doing this work as well as other opportunities to connect with each other, to learn together um, and to take action. So please do sign up with our, uh, for our newsletter um, and the link will also be in the chat. Um, and also share your stories with us. Uh, we do profiles of members and so we wanna highlight your work um, as well. And we hold movement calls like this one um, on a quarterly basis. So we'll be hosting those next year too. Um, and we want to be able to highlight your uh, art, your music, the ways that you're using art and music um, to engage communities and to uh, join the fight for land and environmental justice. So, so please share that with us as well. Uh, and finally, there's you know obviously a number of events happening at COP if you are there in person. Um, and so there's ways to engage. Uh, we'll put in the chat a list of all the events that are happening uh, at COP over the next few days and weeks, um, in person and virtually. So see see what you can join and connect with other network members that way. Um, and I just want to highlight one event that is happening tomorrow as well, uh, organized by our members in West Africa. Uh, around women taking the lead on climate action. And you'll hear be able to hear live and recorded performances from artists around uh, climate justice and women's rights. So please uh, do register and join that uh, virtual event as well. Um, so that's a little bit about next steps and there's many ways to engage with our movement. And so we hope that uh, you'll continue to stay connected to, to each other um, and with us. So thank you all so much and thank you all for uh, engaging, for listening, for sharing such insightful comments and questions. And thank you so much to our amazing interpreters for keeping, keeping us all connected. So thank you all.